the right I think this one is up. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here on a snowy April day. Um, and I am so thrilled to be here to moderate this um, panel discussion with Evelyn Borayo, who is coming to us virtually. Uh, my name is Stacy Fisher. I'm one of the co-program leaders in cancer prevention and control. And Evelyn, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thanks, Stacy, for moderating in person. Uh, my name is Evelyn Borayo, and I am faculty at the Colorado School of Public Health and associate director for community outreach and engagement at the Cancer Center. And one of the reasons that we wanted to have this panel today is because there is really exciting work going on across all of our programs um, that is specifically disparities focused and catchment focused. And it may be a, a phrase that you've heard around people we talk about the catchment. And, and I think for a lot of us, we may not even understand what that even means, the catchment, but it's the area that we're that the geographic area that we're responsible for in terms of our, our research portfolio and how we think about the impact of the research and the work we're doing within the cancer center and how it impacts the patients that we, that we care for. So that from a research perspective looks like the state of Colorado. Um, and so in our focus populations are um, our patients that we're really interested in underrepresented minorities, um, specifically Latinos, those who African Americans, um, those who come from impoverished backgrounds, and those who are living in rural areas. Those are some of the patients that are most likely to experience some of the greatest disparities. And so today we're going to get a little sampling and a discussion, and I hope that it becomes a very interactive discussion with you all of representatives from across the programs that are doing, a, are really addressing some of these questions in innovative, out of the box thinking sort of ways. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what they're doing. All right, hello, good afternoon. So I'm Patricia Valverde and I'm an assistant professor in the Colorado School of Public Health. I'm in the Department of Behavior, Community and Behavioral Health. And I'm also interim director of the Latino Research and Policy Center. Um, and I'm sure many of you have never heard of LRPC, but we're a center um, ho housed at the UCD campus, but structurally within the Colorado School of Public Health. And our whole mission is to reduce Latino cancer and other health disparities. So I'm gonna talk about two programs. Oh, and another thing is I run a training program for health navigation and community health workers, which um, as you go out in the field, hopefully you will run across and interact and work alongside this um, professional field. So I'm gonna talk about two programs, one of which I'm not involved in at all, but my colleague Andy Dwyer was unable to be with us. So um, I wanted to tell you about the Colorado Cancer Screening Program or CCSP. It's one of the longest standing programs within the Cancer Center focused on cancer prevention. And it's been around for 15 years, primarily through funding from the state tobacco uh, revenue. And uh, so basically they utilize cancer navigators who are primarily lay people, so they're not nurses or social workers, and they're housed within the federally qualified health centers and rural health centers and many other sites across the state. 
Um, and over the past 15 years, they've navigated 37,000 community members into cancer screening, which resulted in the detection of over 400 cancers and prevented well over 550 cancers. And so they've done that by using evidence-based strategies, navigation being one of them, but media campaigns, texting programs, really trying to integrate um, or implement evidence-based strategies for cancer prevention un for those underserved populations. Um, they have saved the healthcare system uh, over 20 million over the past 15 years and worked with some 200 clinics. So that is like a, you know, one of those foundational programs that works to reduce health disparities um, across all populations and throughout the state. The other program I want to mention, oh, and so let me just mention, it's led by Dr. Betsy Risendahl, Andy Dwyer, and Elsa Staples. Um, and so that's, if you have questions about CCSP, you can reach out to them. The other program is a, an American Cancer Society grant that um, Dr. Fisher and myself are co-PIs on. And again, uh, it was Andy Dwyer that, that somehow miraculously was able to pull together the UC Health uh, nurse navigator and administrative staff to come together and first submit the proposal and, and we got funded and now we're working on system-wide issues and that really is amazing. Our UC Health System has about 44 nurse navigators working on or assisting patients that are uh, diagnosed with a variety of cancers, you know, including the, you know, the main ones, but also many other um, you know, other cancers uh, like kidney and and um, blood cancers, et cetera. So the purpose of this grant is to really try to help standardize both the work that the nurse navigators do across the system, but also looking at how do we track the impact that the nav the nurse navigators have. So what are those outcomes so that we can continuously go to uh, administration and advocate for this? important position. Um, also, what are the, so how do we track and what are the outcomes? And so we use EPIC, you know, our EHR, which is very difficult to pull information out of. And so one of the efforts through this grant is to improve how we are able to track the metrics, pull the, the data out of our system and improve the reporting. There are some other um, efforts that we're undertaking through this grant, and that includes um, trying to standardize the workflows and also looking at training. So the kinds of training that our nurse navigators need to um, both improve uh, the care that's provided and um, support their profession. Um, and then another key area is in the um, topic of clinical trials. So the nurse navigators tend to typically do not enroll patients into clinical trials, but they educate patients on clinical trials and they refer patients to clinical trials. And so as you know, trying to diversify who enrolls into clinical trials is of uh, utmost importance to the cancer center. And so these nurse navigators could really have an important role and, and do have an important role. So we're looking at how do we connect them to the other efforts going on within the cancer center to try to ensure that we increase enrollment into our cancer, cancer trials. Um, and then one last thing is our focus. Um, we're really trying to improve all the workflow flows, the training, the standardization in order to improve the impact on uh, for rural cancer patients and Hispanic patients. So it aligns really well with the, um, the priorities that the cancer center has and in our catchment area. So I think that's, that's about it. All right, thanks. Hi, my name is Clay Smith. I'm a hematologist, and up until a month ago, I directed the blood-related adult clinical programs on, on campus. Uh, I also work with CU Innovations, and we do a lot of hopefully novel type of work uh, supporting the development of new therapeutics, new diagnostics. Um, I got very interested in this area because we, on one hand, do a lot of 
very uh, complicated, expensive work in precision medicine, where we're using tools like single cell omics and others to develop new therapies. But we have not at all achieved our mission if people don't have access to these kind of new advances that come out of Anschutz every day. And so uh, as you hear more from uh, my my partner here, Craig Jordan, uh, we have made it an equal part of our mission to try to improve access. And so as one of those efforts, uh, uh, I am the PI on a grant from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society called the IMPACT Grant. Uh, IMPACT program is a national program by the LLS, which uh, includes uh, places like Cornell and Vanderbilt and other city of hope across the country. Uh, that's designed to improve access to clinical trials for blood cancer trials, particularly uh, in rural areas. Um, and so I think as you'll hear in a minute, we have a, on campus a, a really wonderful clinical trials unit, but its reach is limited geographically. And yet our program serves people across the entire Rocky Mountain region, uh, and in some cases from beyond. So we have patients from Montana, northern Montana, the border of Canada, down to southern New Mexico. Uh, and their ability to access some of these cutting edge treatments is really quite limited. I think it falls off probably uh, by mile by mile as you live farther from campus. It's, it's hard to access trials. It's hard to participate in trials. Many trials these days are really uh, uh, advancing care, uh, but it also means that we're not really uh, doing trials in a very diverse population. And so this impact grant is designed to, to address that. Uh, we are uh, also looking uh, to lean very heavily on Nurse Navigator and our first plan working with Evelyn is to try to set up a Nurse Navigator for Southern Colorado that will help uh, bring <coughs> open and bring to bear some more community-based trials in lymphoma and similar diseases where people may not need the tertiary quaternary care uh, that we deliver here at, at Anschutz. And so hopefully what we can do is uh, get a navigator embedded that will help set up uh, that program, help bring patients in, help educate them, help make that as many of the treatments and the trials that we do can be done locally as opposed to coming back to campus. Because for many people, it's just simply not feasible to come back and forth uh, at the frequency that a trial may require. So this is a very exciting effort for us because hopefully it ties together the, the efforts that we have around these very complex, expensive therapies, but ties it to ways to simplify them, make them accessible, make them affordable, get them out to this, this huge community that we serve across the Rocky Mountain region. Uh, and so I'm here if people have questions or interest in the impact grant, happy to describe that further. So thanks. And I'll hand over to Craig. Thanks, Clay. I'm Craig Jordan. I'm the chief of the hematology division. Um, so I guess I want to just follow up briefly on Clay's comments in, in two main areas, just to elaborate a little bit more about the clinical program. So many of you may realize that the cancer centers had quite a big initiative in the past year uh, to enhance a lot of the DEI efforts uh, for the cancer center in general. And we've partnered with them very closely to do that. And on the clinical side, one of the big things is improving the patient experience. So when people come to the University of Colorado for medical care, we want to make sure that that experience is as positive as possible. And a big part of that, of course, is being able to communicate and having a provider that can understand you. So translation services have been a around for a while, but what we, what's even better is if your doctor actually speaks the same language. So at least within um, the hematology division, we have several providers that are, that are fluent Spanish speakers and they're, we're in the process of establishing a clinic for, for most forms of blood cancer where people can come and be cared for in that kind of context. It's also important for those prov for the, for the providers and the faculty in general to have additional training and cultural and, uh, awareness and, and, and biases and so forth that can occur in the medical system. And so we've been actively pursuing that so that our team is, is, is as facile as possible when it comes for caring for a diverse population. Um, 
on the on the research side, um, I see many laboratory investigators in the audience. I'd be willing to bet that many of you of, of us, and I include myself on that, haven't always thought about the the uh, the biological and ethnic or genetic origin of the samples that we're using. So whether you're working on cell lines in the laboratory or tissue specimens and so forth, does it represent a diverse population? And in many cases, I think you know we haven't paid enough attention to this, and it's a real problem. So one of the initiatives that um, that I know the Cancer Center through the MC program has been working on, and this is led by Tin Tin Su and, and Patricia Ernst, is to make uh, access to a diverse um, uh, cross-section of tissue specimens more readily available. Uh, and I know that, I don't know if either of them are here on the call today, I could let them comment on it, but there are resources available to do much better in the oncology space to try to have a, a, more, a better access to diverse uh, samples. What we've specifically done is establish a collaboration with uh, a large research uh, bank at the University of um, uh, Ohio Cancer Center excuse me, um, Ohio State Cancer Center, um, that has, I believe, the largest collection of, 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 of African-American and Hispanic uh, leukemia specimens in, in the country. Uh, so there's investigators there that have been very excited to interact with us to allow us to, it, to essentially take all the experimental therapeutics and the, and the biological questions we're asking and do that in the context of a much broader uh, genetic diversity of patient populations. And I will tell you, and many of you may appreciate this, that when you, when you look in different ethnic backgrounds, the biology of tumors and the therapies they respond to can be dramatically different. And we've, we've seen this directly in leukemia where the therapies that have been used for decades, uh, mainly in Caucasian patients, don't work nearly as well when you look to people of African ancestry, for example. So understanding the biological differences and doing much better in developing our therapies is, is, a, is a big priority. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop with that and, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Christiana. I'm postdoc uh, at the Department of biomedical informatics as well in immunology and microbiology department. Um, I work with Dr. Paul Norma. So we have been focused on immunogenetics in human population. Uh, so uh, we have been developing this pilot project with cancer samples, uh, getting these samples from Biobank, from Colorado Biobank. So I, I'm very happy with this order because it's, it's matching very well what uh, Professor Smith, right? I uh, just uh, said about the diversity of populations and how we are looking at the patient um, in like everybody's together, but we have to think and ethnicity and genetic background are very important for many things. So uh, our goal is to, um, our, I, the, this pilot project is involve, involve breast cancer controls for breast cancer, lung cancer, and controls for lung cancer. All the samples are provided by Colorado Biobank. And so we have to have, um, uh, the goal was, the goal is actually to try to find susceptibility, genetic susceptibility to this disease and also in non-representative population. Uh, we can say no Caucasians uh, because, because we have been developing a lot of research focused on Caucasians. And when you think about genetic diversity, Caucasians does explain it all. Maybe they cannot explain what we have been failing some points for the cancer treatments and the response of that. Not just cancer, we can think about more disease as well. Um, so our focus is sequence the uh, HLA in cure, so human leukocyte antigens and also cure the killer immunoglobulin-like receptors. They are correlating to presenting uh, antigens and also can present the new antigens that are also important for the cancer biology. So we want to see, and, and the both regions are very, very variable, say the most variable uh, regions in the human genome. And those uh, alleles and those genes, and they are so polymorphic and also the difference of alleles between populations are huge. So when you think about, if one thing that you think about one HLA-A uh, is associated with disease when just thinking about Caucasians, you, sometimes this cannot be replied in the African population and the same for Hispanic. So when you think about the presenting of antigens that can help on the immune response and more effectively or and the also uh, collaborating immune checkpoints, we uh, we are focused on very basic research to try to find the diversity of these genes and um, in, in this population, so in cancer, so lung breast cancer, and how this can impact on immune 
uh, response. Um, so uh, also uh, we can try to we are we 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 are thinking to correlate these also with clinical variants and also which kind of mutations that that uh, tumor can present and maybe can help and uh, more specific treatments. Of course, the personalized medicine thinking about that, but um, the ones problem, not problem, but what I have been facing with the samples that we received. So the biobank have to think that samples that come, okay, uh, samples are coming from, I thought it was my time. Uh, uh, so samples are coming from biobank. So come from patients that can go to UC Health and correlate it. Um, uh, way to collect these patients and how also they have to give the DNA for a biobank. So we have to think all the recruitment as well. So all the steps of recruitment of the samples, because although we have this idea to collect 750 samples for each of these four groups, um, they are mainly Caucasian population. So um, although we have this question, so how the biobank can just uh, have this uh, profile of patients and also profile of controls. So, uh, I, of course, it's a pilot project. We have a lot of things to explore, but I think it's very nice to to have to be in this panel and meet people there and also know a little bit more about what the the, um, the recruitment uh, have been changing. And also, we have been talking with Evelyn uh, in the last uh, couple of years about that and. As our, our perspective, getting the DNA and the, the clinical data from Biobank, we have a lot of things to do. <laughs> so to try to understand the diversity of genetic diversity of these populations and, and how this can be translated for cancer and immune response. So thank you all very much for giving us this overview and starting starting our own wheels thinking. Um, I just want to open it. I have questions, but I want to open it up to all of you first because I want to make sure your questions are heard. Does anyone have any initial questions? Yeah, I'm going to get some steps in. Hi, um, my name is Lorna. And I work in radiation oncology as a researcher. Um, my question is to do with, I was at a conference last year and at the end of it, um, an MD who worked in a community hospital said that she hadn't seen a single thing that she could take back to her population that she served in the entire conference because any reference made to rural medicine or working with underserved populations was in a special session on DEI. Um, I'm interested to know how we can partner more closely with community hospitals and those serving rural populations to ensure our research and advances are relevant to them. Uh, so it's it's a tough problem. Uh, the research infrastructure is complicated. There's a lot of regulatory requirements, a lot of people. I think at one point we calculated that each clinical research coordinator could follow about 10 people a year uh, because of all the paperwork and other work that they have to do. So uh, getting this set up to do clinical trials across a broad area, which I think we must do. I don't think we can only do clinical trials here at Anschutz. And I would say it's unfortunate Wells is not up here because uh, medical oncology has actually done, started to do this, They're actually pretty far ahead of us in hematology and how to uh, take all of this very resource intensive effort to do clinical trials out into communities, both around uh, Denver and uh, beyond. So it's definitely feasible to do. It's hard to do. Um, one of the things that I think in addition to just, uh, I, I am a big believer in the nurse navigator model. Uh, I think they're going to be really, really key to growing this across uh, the state. And I do think our catchment area actually for many, many of our programs is across the Rockies and beyond. So we have to think about that. I also think though, there's other innovative, this is my CU Innovations hat that I put on. There are other innovative ways to try to think about doing clinical trials in a geographically distributed way, like doing remote monitoring, telemedicine. And so I think the future is going to be building in a lot more of those tools as well to allow people, you know, in rural Montana or Wyoming to participate in clinical trials. They can't 
possibly drive back and forth to Anschutz because they've got work and families. But we can, through new technologies, bring much of that care uh, to them as well. Um, so I would say if you're interested in doing that, we're, there's a big thirst. We're, you know, we all are are here. Would love to talk with you about uh, what's what are the challenges, but also what are the opportunities. And doing it for radiation oncology would be really quite important, right? Because that's a huge part of of how we treat people. Uh, Is that okay? Uh, of course. <laughs> I know I shouldn't have sat in the first row. So, uh, yeah, but I think, so UC Health does have a pretty big research footprint. Um, we have 47 FTEs north, 27 south, and of course, hundreds here. Um, we're, we're in the process of partnering with our 14th hospital. So we'll have 14 hospitals in the system. Um, and we also support research at Denver Health. Um, through funding of a, a coordinator. Um, and I know some of this is in process and also for, for um, part of the faculty time. Um, and I agree with uh, Clay that I think for rural populations, we do have a number of rural clinics, um, but trying to open all the trials and also the research pharmacy ends up being an issue. But, you know, there could be visits that they do locally and then, then for the complex stuff or something could come here. So sort of a hybrid um, type of model, but we have patients across UC Health. Uh, we have, first of all, we have hundreds of thousands of patients enrolled in research um, from biobanking to therapeutic trials. Um, we, and they're in every county of the state. Um, so it really does stretch across, um, you know, the entire state. Some of the more complex cancer stuff like phase one, that's going to be really hard to export. But but from a trial standpoint, we do have enrollments really across the state, north, south, central, all of our satellites, we have trials open. Um, and north and south actually open their own studies sometimes that aren't directly affiliated with ours. I'll chime in too from more of a CPC perspective um, as well. You know, using the principles of community participatory action research is really another way to hear the community's voice. Um, and so I think Evelyn and I and Jennifer Riker have been working, and Jan Lowry have been working um, for the last and year or so on a patient advisory panel um, to bring in those diverse voices across the state from different backgrounds um, that can be advising all kinds of research, clinical trials included. Also, basic science research, prevention research, survivorship research. That's another way. Yes. All right. Good. <laughs> um, so I have uh, a, a couple questions. Um, so it was mentioned the challenges that y'all have. One of them, affordability, considering how America is with their healthcare. We are with our healthcare. Um, affordability um, has kind of led to um, one level of apprehension with even coming to a cancer center, right? Um, and so some of the populations that y'all are targeting, the Latino population, African-American population, rural populations tend to have less resources to, you know, be able to come to us, you know, there, there's apprehension that's built up there. So how do you overcome that with the programs that y'all are putting forth, one? And two, considering the amount of heterogeneity among the Latino population, among African-Americans, from an ancestry standpoint, from a geographic standpoint, et cetera, et cetera, um, do your programs incorporate that information as well as far as helping with health disparities? Thanks. Uh, so great questions. Thank you. Uh, so the the first the first question uh, it, this is just my personal belief. I think we have to do a much better job bringing care to people and reaching out out beyond Anschutz uh, campus. And we've got to listen to people. Uh, we have to understand what limits their access. Uh, I worked in Canada for a long time as a doctor, so lived in a universal healthcare system. I'm going to avoid getting very political, but I personally believe it's an absolute human right to everybody should get access to healthcare. 
Uh, we see people that come here with insurance problems and others that uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's wrong. Uh, there are efforts both at the hospital and others to try to address some of those problems here on the campus. But I think the, the big solution is we've got to think like Wells program and other programs that you've heard about, about how do we extend our footprint from Anschutz progressively out into other communities and how do we partner with them? Uh, how do we think about how do we get the quality of care, the access to trials uh, and research that you get on Anschutz? How do we do that locally? Uh, I'm a big believer, as you've heard, that nurse navigators that live locally are embedded in the community uh, that help help people understand the, the healthcare system. Uh, hopefully, most of you have not had to use it much. It's unbelievably complicated. Uh, even as a doctor, I frequently have to call my friends and figure out who do I see and how can I get into that clinic because they just told me the wait is six months long. So just imagining that process uh, outside of this campus without those kind of immediate resources is just really uh, both disturbing and daunting. And I think the nurse navigators that understand how to get people through the system to the right person, the right time, I, I think that's a really, really key element to all this. I also personally believe, as you just heard, that uh, you don't think about technology is being very affordable, but some of the things that we're talking about, like being able to do a, a telephone consult, uh, uh, you can think about ways to make them affordable. And that brings that kind of care a, uh, from the campus out into the community. We saw during COVID that that was all possible. Uh, the One of the biggest, you're gonna cut me off in a minute, so I'll, I'll try to keep this short. Uh, it's very interesting in, the, in our society uh, during COVID, telemedicine exploded and we proved technologically that really good care could happen. Uh, that's all drifting back down and it's driven a lot by economic issues. Uh, people don't get reimbursed for doing telemedicine, which is like completely and utterly backwards. So if you want to have an impact, uh, influence the lawmakers and others that ultimately decide where healthcare dollars are spent to think about uh, creating these kind of distributed technologies that allow people to access uh, better care. It's totally mind blowing to me that, you know, two days after COVID started, we had distributed these really wonderful telemedicine resources across the whole Rocky Mountain region. And now they're all disappearing. It just seems totally crazy and backwards. So I think there are things that we can and, and uh, could do for the access part of this. Uh, but I think we have to be very proactive and we have to do it both at a societal level and personally as researchers and doctors and, and, uh, and people in this country. I will tell you, universal healthcare is not a panacea. Uh, having lived through that, there's a lot of problems with it as well. Uh, it's very hard to afford. So you have to be practical about those kind of things. But to have a baseline where everybody can access care, I think is going to be really fundamental to this as well. Um, and you, you, you know, everybody here knows all the politics that go into that kind of stuff. So uh, you want to talk about science? Or? Well, yeah, no, just to add a second question about the diversity, you make a great point. So, so when we say Hispanic, that's a very broad term, right? Yeah all kinds of diversity just within that general grouping. And so personally, I think that um, there's some, pretty, I think, pretty encouraging signs, right? So the biobank here, and maybe you'd like to comment as well, um, has captured a, a pretty good uh, 50, 50 to 60,000 patients now. So we're getting to the point where we can do polymorphism uh, analysis on fairly large populations, but these banks are all collaborating with, with uh, banks across the country. So the numbers are getting into the millions. So you're beginning to get to the point where you can start to parse some of that. But I think the collaboration amongst the genetic investigators to, to, to your point, Ed, is going to be really important. And then we can start to parse down, okay, how does care differ as a consequence of specific uh, genetic backgrounds? And that's that's a huge undertaking. The VA is involved in a big uh, piece of that. If there's anybody here that wants to comment on that, they have their million veteran initiative and so forth. So those kinds of large genetic initiatives, I think will get us there eventually, but it, but it, we're, we're just, we've just scratched the surface, right? Do you want to talk about Philip? Yeah, um, from, from the samples that we have been uh, facing, uh, we have many things. So for example, the sample, um, I received the sample, I see, I see the DNA, I also ask for the clinical information. So also I received the ethnicity or race 
is an auto declaration is uh, the physician or the maybe the the nurse did this and beginning so uh when i have the numbers i don't know if what's really um translating what I, what I have about background. So I, I really believe that have polymorphism that can be a marker for specific population can help us to trace this better and also to have a better profile. So this can also be very helpful to understand the structure. So in thinking about biobank and now, but also we sometimes we don't have a very nice polymorphism marker for some populations. Uh, so of course, when the same thing is panic. When you talk about Hispanic, I'm from Brazil. I'm not considered Hispanic, <laughs> for example, but I'm from Latin America. So I'm very different. And when you're thinking about South America, um, Central America, and Mexico is totally different. Inside Mexico is different. So we have a lot of things to, to, to really dig in and try to understand. And also when you think about African, oh my gosh, this is a other, another world. So we think they have to think about all the migration and also the evolution things. And I work with immunogenetics, so we also think uh, how this can shape um, the diversity and response of disease, of virus, for example. So this is something that um, the first, sometimes we don't have the precise tools yet, but we, I think we are working on this. Uh, we have to reach more population, more diversity on population, we can understand better the basics and then maybe try to create these other things as to maybe have a more uh, better uh, therapeutic approach and also the diagnosis as well can help. So I totally agree what you're talking about here. So have to have more information to understand better. So it's really good to have biobanks and biobanks in collaboration, have more people looking at and also have more more funding also seeking uh, underrepresented underrepresentative populations. Uh, but of course, to have to talk with them and explain what we are doing, because I think this maybe could be the hardest part and say, I want, I'm here to help you. I want here to get your better life, but how can I also give back? So how the biobank, for example, can give back to the patients? So I think I have a lot of questions, Mark. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Thank you. So I just wanted to add a little bit about what uh, nurse and lay navigators do. So given the system that we have, the, the navigators try to help scaffold the different kinds of support that a cancer patient needs so that they can actually go through treatment. And so they are doing the work to, to kind of fill in all the gaps that we have in our system. So the navigators are typically the ones that will work alongside social workers to make sure that cancer patient has transportation to radiation oncology, um, gets copay assistance, um, completes medication assistant program applications. There's like all sorts of resources out there. They're little, you know, $500 here, uh, food, um, food delivery there, transportation here, but it takes a lot of effort to get everything um, that you're potentially eligible for. And that's what a navigator is able to do. And um, because their primary role is to reduce barriers to care. Some of them are clinical barriers and the, you know, the, the very complicated and, and, um, and frustrating system that we have generally, as well as just logistical barriers like finances and um, transportation and, you know, how do you talk to your, your, the friends and family that want to support you, you know, while you're going through trans, uh, treatment. So that, that's what they do. That's what this role is meant to do to, to help, um, reduce the impact of the system that we have. And then I wanted to make one other comment about the, the like what you had said, the differences of Hispanics and Latinos. So in LRPC or the Latino Research Policy Center, we actually have a Latino health certificate that's in the School of Public Health. And we taught, you know, the whole purpose is to help uh, public health students understand that you really you have this huge category. You really have to do subgroup analysis to get a sense of what's truly going on. And in Colorado, you know, most of our Latinos are Mexican American or Mexican. But if you look at um, data at health outcomes by generational status, acculturation, language, 
Um, it could be home country. You, you see differences. And so it is really important that if we truly want to understand many of those health disparities, we need to do more than just look at one, you know, race or ethnicity category, but look at other um, components that help explain different behaviors, different, you know, diet, different um, social systems. So it's, um, that's one thing that we're, that we um, teach graduate level students and feel very strongly about in our research. Going to the diversity that we've been talking about, uh, when we talk about Hispanic populations or Latino American populations or African American populations, the genetic diversity that we see from, for all those people who are in the US is probably going to be different from his people in the Hispanic countries in the African countries. And so two parts of the question is that the, the research that we are doing with all these diverse populations here, do you think those would be applicable if we go to the populations in the Hispanic African countries? And if not, is there a probably a long-term pilot program or something where it, it is possible to collaborate with cancer centers in all those countries and then either set up clinical trials there or get patient samples here so that we can do the same research that is been going on for all the African American or Hispanic American populations here. You want to take that or? I'll, I'll make one comment. So when we look at Hispanic health outcomes, just generally, we do see that with acculturation, they get worse. So as Hispanic and Latinos, I use them fairly interchangeably, but as they become more Americanized, adopt more American um, habits, health gets worse. <laughs> Their health gets worse. So, um, so based on that, I would say, no, we would see some differences because, um, you know, and it would be different if you're talking about Mexican versus other countries. So um, the indigenous admixture, you know, the indigenous influence differs greatly across Mexico, Central America, and South America. So that's all I'll, I'll add. I'm not the <laughs> genetic person. So, so it's a great point. So um, I just want to emphasize, and Ed brought this up as well, there, there's the sort of um, extrinsic component and intrinsic component, right? So when you look at, say, an African-American population, you say, well, access to care is really poor, so that's why their outcomes are worse. There's, that's absolutely true in certain respects, but you can normalize for that, and this has actually been done pretty carefully now. You can normalize for access to care, look at patients that actually were able to get to the clinic to get the same therapy as other patients, and they still do much worse in certain specific subcategories. So the initial sequencing of this, I'm talking about leukemia specifically, because that's what I know about, in, in those leukemic patients, there's been about 50 or so in our collaboration that have had, had whole exome sequencing. Not only are they finding mutations that they've never seen before, there's patients with a, you know clinical leukemia, a doctor like Clay would say, yep, that's AML, they don't recognize any of the mutations, right? That's how different it is, right? And so until we begin to parse that and understand, okay, in different ethnic subject groups, those are the mutations that drive the disease, then obviously we're completely blind. And then and on top of that, your point that somebody you know, for, for, who's migrated from Africa uh, several hundred years ago may have diverged as well. It's a, all I can say is it's a huge problem and we have to obviously do more and more analysis of patients across the, the globe to really dig deeper. But we don't even understand the basic mutations for people in this country that are getting leukemia, right? So that's to me the starting place, yeah. That's uh, a very excellent point. Um, well, I'm geneticist by formation, so I work with Brazilian population, and mixed population, and also um, I really like this topic. I think this topic is important because when you think about structure, uh, genetic structure, you're, tell, you're telling a story anyway, because we, we when sometimes is uh, we want to translate to the disease, but we have to understand the population. So that's why population population genetics is so important and sometimes ignored because. The part fund is another thing, uh, but it's a very important point. This U.S. is a very it has a different countries inside. So when you think about 
about the Caucasians, we can think about people from England, Ireland, and people from, from other places also can have been constructed this country. So how is the admixture, admixture rate? as well. Here is lower than Brazil for sure. <laughs> in Brazil, we have the admixture uh, rate very, very high. So it's a little harder. And, and I heard last week when one panel that probably Brazil is explaining what will happen in the future in other countries, because we have been admixture for a long time. And probably we have the greatest uh, diversity there. But, but just pointing here, um, we have to think about the history. So which kind of population from Africa was slated to be here and uh, they try to trace the start back, for example. So when you think about structure, so I have to think about all their history. So uh, many Mexica, Me Mexican inside the Mexican and, and, and go on um, about genetic structure. Of course, I'm focusing on that, focusing on that. And also we have a lot of uh, evolution points. So. Uh, that we can also think in how this structure can help uh, help you to understand this uh, the diversity of the population, also how this could be correlated to disease and cancer, for for example. Uh, but also we cannot ignore all the cultural cultural things and ethnicity things so, because it's something that is sometimes people just be mix and put everything together. Genetic genetic background is different from ethnicity sometimes and different from race sometimes depends what you're calling so ethnicity is talk more a language and culture and other things so is simpler mean uh to like just have a general idea but you have to think that it's a background of the person and probably this could also be related to this is a susceptibility and other uh things um but when you think about some kind of cancer, so for, for example, breast cancer is the have a, be a woman, African American woman, and also some Af um, women from African countries, the the risk to develop breast cancer is higher when you compare to other ethnicities. So something is happening. Maybe is a healthcare problem access or maybe it's a genetic and other thing that could be related. So I think now we're increasing this focus, um, looking in different population, maybe you can start to uh, answer better these questions and, and see if you can uh, translate these to other countries or not. Answer your question, I guess. I'm going to take a moderator's privilege for a minute and just weigh in a little bit on this. Um, I was recently in part of a panel discussion um, within palliative care research and looking and talking about these questions about heterogeneity um, with three, I would say, nationally recognized leading palliative care researchers and getting the pushback and having also sat on a study section that sometimes the the question around heterogeneity can be another way that we just kind of stop disparities research. It's too complicated. We're not getting in. There's there's too much heterogeneity. You're looking at this monolithically. But I would also argue that you don't see that argument. And you kind of touched on this when we talk about a, like a white population where there is just as much heterogeneity in that. Um, and to not let not let that stop the work to be done, not to feel that it's so daunting or so overwhelming that we can't address it. Um, I think it just underlines the importance of that work. Another question, yes. Oh, okay, Evelyn, I'm gonna. Yeah. Hi. Um... <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're Mac people. We don't, talk to them. <laughs> we don't have any questions on the chat, so go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I think a barrier to care I have seen in the clinic has to do with language a lot um, and what language people speak or are fluent in, or they might not even know any English. And I'm curious if something else I've seen is with the rise in technology and with the rise in cancer detection methods, a lot of patients are getting the results on their phone or on their computer way before they're able to see a physician. 
but those results are always in English. I have seen, do patients ever have the ability to have those impressions translated for them? Uh, you, you, are you okay? Um, so I can uh, tell you my experience as a physician. So on the inpatient unit, they have, uh, what they've done is they've got uh, basically video screens on rollers that you roll around and people will, will translate. That's actually fairly limited in the clinic. Uh, so there's a big difference already between inpatient and outpatient and as, you, as you go around. Um, even, even with the translator there, my, my own personal feeling is there is a big gap that you have and, the, and uh, it's a huge issue because a lot of the conversations you have are very informal. You know, you're talking with patients about their family or what they, what they uh, care about. Those are really hard to do when you're doing through a translator. It becomes very, very sort of just focused on the you know, nuts and bolts of their medical problem, which uh, for all of you that are in the clinic know that's just a tiny bit of our interactions with people. So it's a, it's a big problem. Uh, there are efforts, uh, I think Wells may be speaking to those in a second about how to translate these materials across as barriers, but uh, I don't know how many different types of languages I've heard rounding on the inpatient unit, but it's got to be many, many dozens. And so uh, those efforts become, become pretty difficult. Um, we have tried also, we have Spanish speaking people in our division. We call on a lot to help us with things. Uh, some of us take courses, but are pathetic. I, I can't, I can barely speak English as you can tell much less, uh, something else. Um, so it's a, it's a huge, uh, problem. There is much lost in the attempts to translate. I, I have not seen technology yet address this very well. Um, there's a lot of nuances in language that, you know, don't get passed from English to other languages and vice versa. Uh, the hope would be things like chat GPT and others can help solve that. I, I haven't, I don't know how many of you have talked to chat GPT. I don't know why I talk to it every night for what it, it's like my social life. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's still, we hear a lot about the promise of AI. I think it's still got a long way to go to address those kind of issues. Uh, so I th think you brought up a, a wonderful point. It's it's addressed in sort of a piecemeal fashion as best as it can. Uh, hopefully, technology and other approaches will will help fill that gap in coming years. Um, well, so you could well, I'll just say as a clinician, it's better than it was. That's for sure. So we we do have these iPads, and we have like three of them in clinic. So usually it's not a problem to get one, but they can do like a hundred languages. You basically just press whatever language you want. Um, and then someone pops on the screen, who knows where they're located, but then they'll translate for you. And then as a provider, um, if you know your patient is Spanish speaking or something else, I just do Google Translate. So like an impression comes to me, I'll, you can tack on a note to any lab result or any scan result or any pathology result. And so you can put in, um, I type it in English and Google and I just pop it over into the, into the note. Um, and then we're trying to make sure that as many materials, uh, study consents, everything is translated in Spanish. We have like a general handout on our phase one program that's translated into Spanish. We have a clinic in Spanish called Esperanza and Español. We've hired Spanish speaking uh, navigators um, and not just Spanish speaking navigators, but people are also familiar with the community and the barriers and all that thing. So definitely better than we were where you kind of like waiting for a translator. Someone doesn't show up. You never you can't even have the appointment, but not where we want to be. Um, I, a follow-up question to that, and and I don't know if anyone has that answer, the answer to this, but do we know what the uptake is in the EHR, the My Health Connect, or um, is for non-English speaking patients? I, I worry that that's another gap that could further increase. So I think to your point, um, it's a challenge because you get one word wrong, you leave out a not. Uh, you know, those kind of things are really problematic. So it's not, it's not quite as easy as just translating and, and in real, you know, in real time. Uh, and I would just reiterate again, I find a lot of the joy in the practice of medicine is the, is just the conversations with people. You learn so much about what, you know, what's important to them, what's going on. Then they start to share, well, I actually have a different problem that I came in for. And those get lost a lot in these, in these translation barriers. So I think it's a, 
you know, there's been much progress as you've heard, it's way better than when I was a young doctor. Uh, but I think that's one of the areas that hopefully, you know, technology and, and us doing better with uh, uh, how we staff our clinics, et cetera, will, will help move that forward. So I just had a quick question on uh, something that was mentioned earlier as far as uh, barrier, barriers and apprehension that I'm just curious uh, and also kind of relates to underrepresented minorities in the biobank as far as trying to increase that representation. Has there been any partnering and trying to do some sort of like uh, health fairs to try and recruit patients for the biobank. I know that recruitment happens when they're already in the hospital for other reasons. Has there been any partnering between, you know, LRPC and biobank? Is that a possibility or avenues for potential grants to try and increase the representation by doing those sorts of activities and working together? So, so I can speak to a couple of your points. It's a great question. Um, so, so I know, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, experts talk about it. The biobank here captures everybody who walks through the hospital door, and, and literally everybody is asked if they're willing to, if they have a, a bodily tissue, they can get, they can get at least a DNA sample. And so that's obviously not selecting, for, for trying to enrich those populations, but it's at least beginning to capture a broader uh, community. And again, there's there's quite a bit of sharing of the genetic information across biobanks across the country. And so that hopefully that's beginning to capture a broader um, popular uh, cross section of people and some of the subgroups that were otherwise missing. Um, the for for at least I know I would invite others to comment. I think in cancer research, the the immediate need is is a tumor, right? So. Uh, the health fairs and so forth are a great idea in terms of engaging people's in, in awareness, but it doesn't really help you capture the types of research, at least the cancer center is thinking about. For those, you need to go to those populations that are being cared for and try to find a, a way to encourage um, participation. And I, I don't know, I could let Clay comment this as well. I think there's a huge trust issue. And I've heard about this certainly from the Native American population as well as others where they feel like um, and I'm sure language barriers don't help with this, where they feel like consenting to have their tissues analyzed is, is somehow not safe for them. And so I think you bring, you bring up a great point that uh, having the, the ability to communicate with patients when they come to the clinic, not only for their own care, but participating in, for example, allowing their, their tumor to be analyzed, you know, you have to be able to communicate with them and 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 and, and make it clear that this is, this is meant to be for their benefit. And so yet another thing on the long list of things that we need to do better, in my opinion. Do you want to add? Um. I don't have so many information about how Biobank has been approaching. So maybe we should take care of it because I understand the department. I think it would be nice. Um, but um, the feeling that I have, we have to increase the marketing. <laughs> so um, although we can be used to help, but sometimes we don't know about Biobank. I know because I work here, you know, so I know. Uh, but what's the 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 what the interest? Uh, how can we? We do this better. I think it's something that would be very, very interesting to um, talk more and, and try to understand how can we reach different kinds of people in, inside of the uh, health insurance or also maybe be uh, correlated to that kind of effort. But I totally agree. I think maybe some effort would be very uh, welcome to try to, to bring people um, to participate in research. Okay, I think we have one more minute for one last question. Thank you. Sorry to keep everyone. <laughs> um, so when I think about kind of what you touched upon a little bit here, Craig, is this trust, right, and, and establishing trust in these communities, um, I think a really overlooked um, component of all of this is really increasing the representation of those that facilitate these efforts, right? That oftentimes people from within these communities can't identify people facilitating these um, initiatives that they can relate to. So I'm just wondering if there are any initiatives uh, from Cancer Center, from hematology, um, where it's really focused on the recruitment and retention um, of doctors, researchers who fall into these uh, communities. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So so recruitment of diverse populations is actually one of our highest priorities. Now, when we advertise for jobs, we usually we don't have 
hundreds of applicants, we actually are usually fighting over those applicants from different institutions. So I'm not trying to make excuses, but it's it, there are certain situations where recruiting diverse populations are more challenging. I, th I think at the trainee level, we try to we we've done pretty well. Uh, there's been a very I know all the graduate programs. I'm personally involved in some of the recruitment committees and so forth, are trying very hard to make uh, access as good as it possibly can. I don't know if is, if Eduardo's on the line here. I know Eduardo Davila, who's the head of the head of the education program for the Cancer Center, has also been very actively involved and has actually has specific grants that are they're targeted at minority populations. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society now has grants available specifically for underrepresented populations, trainees, and so forth. So I feel like we're doing better at the trainee level. At this, at the higher, at this more senior levels, it's harder just because there's very few of those folks available. And that's that's a very sad statement, I think, on our society. Um, and so we've we've tried to be as as aggressive as we can there, but it has been hard. Anybody else want to comment? Yeah. Evelyn, did you want to add something? Let's go over our shoulders to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I would definitely agree with everything that has been said. I think there is momentum, particularly at the Cancer Center, with the NCI requirements to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion across. Um, it's, you know, once there's a standard and a requirement, uh, more efforts going to that, right? And I think we will start to see uh, some changes, perhaps given given those initiatives in hiring more diverse workforce. All right, it's 101. Please, everyone join me in thanking our amazing panelists. <laughs> Stay safe, stay warm. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining.